15. Nick Nidev In December 2016, footage of a man jumping off a princess cruise ship was uploaded to YouTube. Filmed by an eyewitness who was heard laughing in the background, the clip was accompanied by almost no details of when and where the incident actually happened. The video showed the unnamed man thrusting himself off the bow of the ship while it sat in port. He was then seen swimming toward the person recording. While commenters on the video pointed out that the man jumped from a survivable height, others have been known to take deadlier risks. In early 2019, a 27-year-old man from Vancouver, Washington, named Nick Nidev made headlines for jumping off a Royal Caribbean ship during a cruise in the Bahamas. According to several reports, Nidev took the 120-foot plunge from the Symphony of the Sea's deck while his friends filmed the act for an Instagram video. Nidev's buddies could be heard laughing right before he jumped, but they seemed genuinely surprised that he went through with it. They sounded even more relieved when they saw him swimming and knew that he had survived. After all, many, if not most people who jump off cruise ships do not live to tell their tale. A smaller boat eventually picked Nidev up, and he was quickly ordered to grab his belongings and leave the cruise ship as soon as possible. Bahamian police declined to charge him for the stunt, leaving him free to pay the small $200 fee that it cost to fly him back to Miami. Royal Caribbean banned him from their cruises for life, though, and while a few social media users thought Nidev was funny, a greater number of commenters thought he was downright stupid and disapproved of his actions. But even after everything, it was still all fun and games to Nidev, who mentioned in a comment thread under the video that he was drunk from the night before when he took the plunge. He went on to say that once he sobered up, he was in severe pain. Nidev said he was hurting so badly that he was hardly able to walk or sleep for three days afterward. 14. Bintuzi People do a lot of crazy things for a bit of attention on social media, and sometimes the consequences are pretty substantial. A young man from China's Jilin province named Bin Tuzi experienced a terrifying but hilarious close call in early 2024 when his pants caught on fire during an immature prank that was caught on camera. In the footage, the person filming was seen igniting a lighter near Tuzi's crotch as he lay with his back end facing the camera. If you hadn't already guessed, he was doing what many had done before him. He was trying to light his fart on fire. Unlike most of the individuals who had already filmed themselves igniting their flatulence and shared it on social media, the flame actually spread to Tuzi's pajama pants. He was seen flailing wildly and rolling over in a heated panic during the one or two seconds it took to extinguish the back-end blaze while his friend just kept recording and laughing hysterically. Thankfully, the fireball didn't seem to cause any serious injuries and the fire didn't spread. While lighting one's farts on fire seems like nothing more than a harmless gag, experts advise against doing so, especially since the flammability of flatulence can vary depending on the amount of fiber a person has recently consumed. Huh, the more you know. 13. Yuri Andrade As the 2021 Super Bowl game between the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and the Kansas City Chiefs inched towards the finale of the fourth quarter, a tattooed man jumped out of the stands and ran across the field in a hot pink high-cut thong leotard, low-riding black shorts, and bright yellow sneakers. Later identified as 31-year-old Yuri Andrade of Boca Raton, the half-naked man was quickly tackled near the end zone and escorted off the field by security personnel. Viral photos captured just a few moments before the takedown showed the brazen prankster smiling proudly with his arms in the air. According to the South Florida Sun Sentinel, the purpose of the stunt was to promote Andrade's friend's adult website, which was advertised across his leotard. The friend allegedly paid another guy, Douglas Schaffer, $5,000 to distract security agents while Andrade stormed through the field. While the display was reportedly carried out strictly for business reasons, Andrade admitted that he got a thrill out of doing it. This much was obvious during interviews, when he described the act as the greatest moment of his life and the most amazing adrenaline rush. Andrade and Schaffer were both charged with misdemeanor trespassing. They each pleaded no contest and were sentenced to one year of probation as well as a hundred hours of community service. 
The judge also ordered the men to write apology letters to the NFL and pay a measly $500 fine. Andrade was also banned from Raymond James Stadium, but he said he was okay with it since he was more of a Dolphins fan anyway. While Andrade was only on the field for a few seconds, his glory was even less short-lived. He became somewhat of a legend for the immature but amusing prank and has even shamelessly admitted that he doesn't regret it at all. 12. Brent Farley Acting on an anonymous social media tip in August 2015, a team of 10 fugitive recovery agents, or bail bondsmen, tried to apprehend a man who was wanted on an outstanding warrant for drug charges in Phoenix, Arizona. Led by 43-year-old Brent Farley, the owner of the North Star Fugitive Recovery Company, the team launched a stakeout in tactical gear. They watched the supposed residents of their target for two hours before finally making their move at 10 p.m. Someone involved in the operation, which included several bounty hunters from Farley's company and Delta One Tactical Recovery, had their cell phone's camera rolling as the team swarmed the property with headlights on, flashlights in hand, and weapons ready. In the video, one team member was seen banging on the doors, while another repeatedly yelled, Roderick, open the door. A man answered from inside the house, then came to the door and told the bounty hunters to turn off the flashlights pointed at his face. He then shut the door, turned on his outside light, and left the house shirtless with a police baton in hand. In a humiliating case of mistaken identity, the team had accidentally targeted the home of Phoenix Police Chief Joseph Yanna, who got into a heated argument with Farley. Thankfully, the rest of the bounty hunters quickly realized they were at the wrong place, and the confrontation ended without anyone getting hurt. Phoenix Police Sergeant Trent Crump later told news outlets that Farley refused to leave Yana's property and continued barking orders to the police chief until another team member stepped in. It was later revealed that the anonymous tip came from Oklahoma, where the fugitive was thought to be hiding out. The person responsible for submitting the false tip was eventually ordered to serve two years of probation for an attempted computer tampering charge. Farley pleaded guilty to one felony count of attempted bail bond agency violation and was handed two years of probation. His attorney claimed that he only pleaded guilty because he didn't have a proper license to act as a bail bondsman during the incident. Four other charges were dropped as part of a plea agreement, including disorderly conduct as well as criminal trespassing. At his sentencing, Farley apologized to both his family and colleagues, but claimed that he was a victim in the situation, which wouldn't have happened at all if the tipster hadn't given him bad information. Never mind the fact that this could have all been avoided if it simply vetted the informant and their claims more thoroughly before ambushing the residents. 11. Jessica Beatty In an alleged scheme that was hilariously described by the smoking gun as monumentally moronic, a 42-year-old woman from Florida named Jessica Beatty stands accused of trying to pass a court-ordered drug test using dog pee. According to a police report, the Clearwater native had been released in December 2023 after being charged with drug paraphernalia and driving with a suspended license. As a contingency of her release, Beatty, who has a lengthy criminal history, including several cocaine-related convictions, was required to undergo random drug testing. If she tested dirty, she would most likely have to face the prospect of having her bond revoked or being sent off to jail. Just two weeks later, Beatty was called to the probation office for a drug test. At some point during the screening, the person tasked with supervising the test caught her with a foreign urine sample. While the details of exactly how the discovery was made aren't clear, this isn't really that surprising. After all, probation officers are difficult to fool, considering the fact that people have tried to pass drug tests using every trick in the book. What Beatty didn't know was that drug tests are capable of detecting the difference between human and dog urine. She allegedly admitted that she collected the urine sample from her aunt's dog. In addition to the charges she was already facing, she now faces one misdemeanor count of urine testing fraudulent practices. Her bond was also quickly revoked, and she remains in custody at the Binalas County Jail while waiting for her next court date. 10. Eileen Schultz in January 2023, 
when 61-year-old nanny Eileen Schultz was fired from her longtime job in Fort Myers, Florida, she allegedly decided to steal the family's dog, Lady, that same day. As soon as the family noticed their beloved lady was missing, they immediately suspected Schultz of being responsible and filed a police report. Luckily, Lady wasn't gone for too long. Law enforcement tracked Schultz down to a local hotel the next morning after searching for the dog overnight. Schultz allegedly denied stealing Lady, but rethought her story after a hotel employee told investigators they saw her with the lost puppy. After being confronted with the clear-cut evidence, she admitted to taking Lady, but said she changed her mind. Instead of returning the dog to her family, though, Schultz dropped her off at an intersection down the road. Much to the family's relief, Lady was found at the home of a local resident, who'd seen her wandering around and took her in overnight. The father of Lady's owner, who got on a plane to Florida from his home in St. Louis the moment he found out Lady was missing, told the press that his four grandkids were devastated when the dog vanished. Heartwarming footage captured by the Lee County Sheriff's Office showed the sweet, tearful reunion between Lady and the kid's grandfather, who expressed gratitude toward law enforcement and the hotel employee for helping with the dog's safe return. In the meantime, police arrested Schultz on suspicion of grand theft. Records show that she was released from jail and the case seems to have been squared away since then. 9. Daniel Orderer A 23-year-old graduate student named Jan Navi Kandula was walking in Seattle one night in January 2023 when a police SUV suddenly came barreling down the street at speeds of up to 74 miles per hour. The vehicle hit the young woman from India, who was thrown 138 feet and killed by her injuries. In accordance with the police department's policy, Officer Daniel Orderer was immediately dispatched to the scene to determine whether or not the officer behind the wheel, Kevin Dave, was impaired at the time of the crash. According to a report, Dave was on his way to an emergency call when he struck Kandula. His emergency lights were activated at the time, but he was only chirping his siren while passing through intersections. A subsequent investigation later concluded that Dave's speed was the main reason for the accident. Orderer, who was the vice president of the Seattle Police Union at the time of this case, conducted a routine assessment of Dave at his local precinct, then left the station in his patrol vehicle. Shortly after, Orderer contacted the union's president, Mike Solon. For the first few minutes of the phone call, he was apparently unaware that his body camera was rolling, and the audio it captured was downright disturbing. During the conversation, Orderer gave Solon a somewhat graphic description of how Candula slammed onto the hood of the car, struck the windshield, and was thrown when Officer Dave pressed on the brakes. It's bad enough that Orderer seemed totally unfazed while remembering the events of a tragic death that had just recently happened. But the decision took a deeply unsettling turn when Orderer laughed right after telling Solon that Candula passed away. In the words of author and Guardian columnist Mustafa Bayoumi, this was no uncomfortable chuckle. This was a hearty laugh from the back of the throat. The nature of Orderer's behavior only got worse from there, as he stated that Candula had limited value and said to just write a check of $11,000 to fix the tragedy. He was also heard saying that Dave was driving 50 miles per hour during the accident, even though an investigation later found that the officer was driving at speeds of at least 63 miles per hour. To be clear, Orderer isn't a dumbass simply because he forgot to turn off his body camera. More than anything, he deserved the title because of the insensitivity of his words. When the recording finally went public eight months after Candula's death, Orderer denied that he was being insensitive at all and claimed that he was just imitating what a lawyer tasked with negotiating the case would be saying. He also said that he didn't think the private conversation was being recorded, but as many activists pointed out, it wouldn't be any less wrong if Orderer had actually remembered to turn off his body cam. In an official statement, the Seattle Police Officers Guild, the police union orderer was the vice president of, implied that the video went viral without the proper context or full story being given alongside it. Shortly after, the story spread like wildfire. Orderer was taken off regular patrol and reassigned to a non-operational position. 
In October 2023, the King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office hired an outside investigation firm to look into Kandula's death. There have been few public updates on the story since then, and there are at least eight active petitions asking authorities to pursue justice for Kandula, the most popular of which has gathered a whopping 75,000 signatures and counting. 8. Kazia Shelton In October 2023, 911 dispatchers in Muncie, Indiana got a call from a local car dealership employee about a 2013 Kia Optima that had just been stolen straight off the lot. The worker told police officers that he was getting the vehicle ready for a test drive when the dealership's phone suddenly started ringing off the hook. Nobody was even on the other end of the line the first time he answered, but when the phone rang again, he decided to pick it up just in case. He got out of the Kia to answer the phone, at which point the suspect, who was posing as a customer interested in purchasing the car, allegedly drove off. Using license plate recognition technology, it didn't take long for investigators to track the vehicle's movement to Indianapolis, over an hour's drive from the dealership, and back to Muncie. In the meantime, they identified the suspect as 20-year-old Kazia Shelton through an application she filled out to buy a car that she had submitted to the dealership's website not long before the incident. According to the authorities, Shelton initially lied about her visit when police paid a visit to her house, but eventually confessed to stealing the Kia in order to drive to a job interview at a local strip club. She allegedly treated the situation as a huge joke and said she shouldn't be arrested because she returned the car by leaving it in a mall parking lot next to the dealership with the key still inside. Investigators said that Shelton claimed she didn't understand why she was being arrested since she no longer had the vehicle. But as most people with common sense know, it's against the law for someone to steal a car, regardless of whether or not they abandon it down the line. It's also illegal for a person to lie to the police about who they actually are. Shelton learned these lessons the hard way and was arrested on felony counts of both auto theft and identity deception. 7. Richard Lee Ortecho Jr. In early 2021, an Indian River County Sheriff's deputy spotted a car erratically weaving through traffic along Interstate 95 in Vero Beach, Florida. According to an arrest affidavit, radar clogged the driver, cruising at speeds of up to 127 miles per hour in a 70 mile per hour zone. The suspect continued barreling along the highway at dangerously high speeds, even after the deputy turned on his lights and sirens to try and pull the vehicle over. Later identified as 21-year-old Richard Lee Ortecho Jr., the driver finally pulled to the side of the road after traffic forced him to slow down. After being handcuffed and read his Miranda rights, Ortencho reportedly apologized for going so fast and said he didn't realize reckless driving was illegal. When the deputy asked the young man why he was driving so fast, he explained that he was listening to a song called A Ciento Venti by a rapper named Track Insano, and in Ortencho's words, Ciento Venti means 120, so I was driving 120. He went on to claim that he didn't notice the deputy's lights and sirens flashing. When the deputy pointed out that it was dark at the time and that his lights should have been clearly visible from quite a distance, Ortecho allegedly blamed his loud music for his failure to notice he was being stopped. A young woman who was riding in the passenger seat of the car reportedly said that she told Ortecho to stop before he pulled over. Needless to say, Ortecho's explanations for his behavior did a poor job of persuading the deputy into letting him go. He was instantly taken into custody on suspicion of a felony fleeing charge, misdemeanor reckless driving, and two drug-related possession charges, bringing his wild joyride to an abrupt end. 6. Daniel Schroeder Most people understand that you should only ever call 911 in the event of an emergency, but of course there are a few exceptions to the norm. 61-year-old Daniel Schroeder of Evansville, Indiana fell into this category in September 2021 when he called 911 to report that he was upset with a female household member for not obeying his rules. He was then arrested for misuse of 911 and pleaded guilty to the charge. Schroeder was given a six-month suspended jail sentence, which allowed him to walk free as long as he kept his promise to not bother emergency dispatchers with any more non-emergency calls. 
He allegedly violated the agreement the next day by calling 911 four times to report that he was feeling tired. Authorities quickly revoked Schroeder's suspended sentence and charged him with another misdemeanor count of misusing 911, which he also pleaded guilty to. The judge overseeing the case amended his original sentence to 60 days in jail and imposed a concurrent 60-day sentence for the recent charge. At the time of the 911-related arrests, Schroeder was already on probation for driving drunk through a cemetery four months before. During this incident, a witness called the police, who observed at least four damaged tombstones after their arrival at the graveyard. By then, Schroeder had left the scene. Deputies later found him along a roadside by a public park, where his car was parked halfway in the road and partly in the grass. His blood alcohol content tested at nearly three times the legal limit, and police also found synthetic drugs inside his truck. Schroeder pleaded guilty to operating a vehicle while intoxicated, possession of a controlled substance, and leaving the scene of an accident. His probation was revoked after his arrests for misusing 911, and the case seems to have been factored into the 60-day jail sentence he ended up serving for these crimes. 5. Anna Stanskowski Most people agree that getting someone's name tattooed on your face is a horrible and stupid idea. So, it was no surprise when a 27-year-old British woman named Anna Stanskowski received widespread outrage when she posted a TikTok video that seemed to show her getting her partner, Kevin's name, scrawled across her forehead in what she claimed was permanent ink. The video immediately went viral, garnering over 19 million views in only a few short days. Many social media users express the type of outrage one would expect to see when they believe a pretty young woman has permanently ruined her face, with some describing the tattoo as a disturbing and pathetic act of devotion to her boyfriend. After all, people do crazy things for love, but most would never even think of going as far as inking someone's name across their forehead. Other commenters responded to the footage with a reasonable dose of skepticism. Some of the more keen-eyed viewers noticed that the tattoo gun didn't have a needle in it and that the young woman's skin wasn't showing signs of irritation, which would be expected after getting a tattoo. Many accused Stanskowski of staging the TikTok in an attempt to increase her social media following. In a series of response videos, she insisted that the tattoo was real, saying in one clip, I know it's a little crazy, but I like to express my feelings, and I think if you really love someone, you should be able to show it off. When asked what she would do if she and Kevin ever broke up, Anna said she would just have to find herself a new man named Kevin. But a lot of people were still skeptical, and with good reason. A little over a week after posting the first clip of her Kevin tattoo, Stanskowski admitted that the art was fake as many had suspected. In a TikTok video confessing to the hoax, she was seen wiping the ink off her forehead with a washcloth. Stanskowski denied being a clout chaser and simply claimed that she pulled the prank in a bid to discourage other young people from impulsively getting tattoos that they might come to regret. She even went as far as saying that as someone with many real tattoos, including a few she regrets, she has a duty to influence people in the right way, to discourage them from making the same mistake she did. The explanation was understandably met with a lot of doubt, and only Anna herself will ever truly know what her motivations behind the hoax were. During the same week, a similar video by another young British woman made rounds on social media. In the footage, 24-year-old tattoo apprentice Georgia Bridges claimed she was getting her boyfriend, Dale's name, inked across her forehead at a parlor in the English village of Edenthorpe. She later said in an interview with Cater's news agency that she got the tattoo because she fully believes in the mantra, go big or go home. Much like the response on Stanskowski's tattoo video, many social media users were skeptical of whether or not Georgia's Dale artwork was real, while others prayed that it wasn't. In a follow-up clip, Bridges admitted that the tattoo was actually fake. She was quicker to confess to her lies than Stanskowski, but her motives for posting the deceptive video are just as unclear. 4. Miracle Rivera 
In 2023, a 20-year-old Florida woman named Miracle Rivera had the pleasure of spending her Christmas Eve in jail after allegedly beating up her 24-year-old boyfriend with a Christmas tree. According to an arrest affidavit, Rivera was angry over her partner's alleged cheating. A disagreement broke out between the two at their St. Petersburg home, at which point Rivera's boyfriend left the couple's bedroom and went to lay on the living room couch. Rivera was accused of following him into the room, picking up their Christmas tree and hitting him with it repeatedly, leaving him with serious scratches all over his arms and upper body. The young woman was then arrested on suspicion of misdemeanor domestic battery and spent a day at the Pinellas County Jail before pleading not guilty and being released on her own recognizance. She was also ordered not to have any illegal contact with her boyfriend, whom she had been living with for about two years, and to return to court at a future date. Just one week later, Rivera allegedly attacked the victim again during another early morning argument. This time, she was accused of striking her boyfriend in the face with a glass vase not long before 7 a.m. on New Year's Day. A responding officer saw visible injuries on the victim and arrested Rivera on a felony charge of aggravated battery with a deadly weapon. The suspect was also charged with misdemeanor domestic battery on top of the domestic charge she was already facing in connection to the Christmas Eve altercation. She remains held without bond pending the outcome of her case. 3. Giancarlo Triaca Since the onset of the selfie era, there's been a strange uptick in people doing incredibly dangerous things on camera in an attempt to capture the perfect picture or get attention through shock value. In either case, aspiring influencers often carry out these thoughtless acts in a bid to increase their social media following, and they often do so without stopping to think of the many ways the situation could go wrong. For example, a 42-year-old Mexican tourist named Giancarlo Triaca was rammed by a wild deer while snapping a photo in close proximity to the creature during a trip to Greece back in 2023. Triaca was on a trip with his wife Erica when the couple became understandably fascinated by an array of wild animals that came up to them, including peacocks and deer. The creatures seemed tame, but if the pair allowed common sense to dictate, they would have known that it was better to play it safe by admiring the animals from a distance. After all, why risk it? After the attack, Triaka told Cater's news service that he was simply trying to take a picture of himself with a smaller deer that was standing in front of him when a large 12-point buck charged him from behind. Shocking footage captured by his wife showed the attacking deer rearing up on its hind legs and ramming Triaka with its antlers, breaking a few of his ribs. The stunned traveler remembered being in severe pain for a few days afterward, but he acknowledged that his injuries could have been much worse. He declined treatment at the hospital and toughed out his recovery with lots of medication and ice. Triaka's story, unfortunately, isn't all that unique. The rising number of selfie-related injuries coincides with the noticeable increase in tourists inching dangerously close to wild animals and getting attacked. Many people are so tired of seeing things like this happen that they think those on the receiving end of an animal's aggression deserve what comes to them, while others take a more forgiving stance. One thing everyone seems to agree on is that people should know better than to invade a dangerous wild animal space. 2. Entitled Traveler Tries to Chase Down Plane Missing a flight is extremely stressful, so it's understandable that people sometimes grow slightly irrational in their attempts to catch a departing plane. But most know when to ease up and accept the fact that they have no choice but to rebook and deal with both the travel delay and extra ticket price. There are a few exceptions, of course, including one entitled woman in 2023 who was so desperate to not miss her flight one day that she ran past security and onto the tarmac as the plane taxied towards its runway. The incident happened at Australia's Canberra Airport, where the woman was trying to catch a Qantas Link flight to Adelaide. As she rushed under the jet, she waved her hands up towards the cockpit, hoping the crew would see her and let her board. 
Witnesses were shocked that the woman managed to get past security, but they were even more surprised that she thought the plane might actually stop and let her on. These thoughts were echoed by countless social media users, who chimed in with their two cents after bystander footage of the incident went viral online. After noticing the crazed woman, the pilot cut the engine for her safety. She was then arrested by the Australian Federal Police and was lucky enough to avoid having her name plastered in news reports, thanks to Australia's privacy laws. And now for number one. But if you want to hear more bizarre and crazy stories, stay tuned after the video for some more content. 1. Michael Holland Known as the Yorkshire Ripper, Peter Sutcliffe killed at least 13 British women between 1975 and 1980. His crime sparked the UK's largest ever manhunt and one of the biggest law enforcement investigations in Britain's history. With as many as 200 cops under his command at any given time, a detective named Dick Holland was one of the top two leaders in the efforts made to identify and capture the serial killer, who was finally arrested in 1981 and sentenced to life in prison. Not everyone follows in their parents' footsteps, and that's okay. Dick Holland's son, Michael, chose not to pursue a career in law enforcement like his father and instead chose to become a gardener. He also allegedly did the exact opposite of his dad and took to a criminal lifestyle, which caught up with him in 2015 when he fell at the center of a police investigation into a suspected drug selling operation. Michael fell under suspicion when detectives in the Scottish city of Musselburgh saw him interacting with a suspect in the case named Stephen Wright, who was seen placing a suspicious black bag into the back of Holland's car. Police then pulled the vehicle over a short while later and found a gram of cocaine in Holland's possession. He claimed that he bought the drug to use as a numbing agent for a wobbly tooth since he was unable to make it to his dentist, whose office was 230 miles away. But Holland was not able to explain the nearly two kilograms of cocaine that officers discovered in the trunk of his car, which was divided into smaller bags for resale. Up to that point, Holland's criminal record was minor, and by the time the case went to trial in 2017, he was already 65 years old and in poor health. The elderly defendant was still found guilty of the charge. During Holland's sentencing, his attorneys depicted him as a beloved community member and argued that he was unlikely to re-offend thanks to his ailing physical health. They also claimed that their client was genuinely remorseful for his actions. Despite this, the judge sentenced Holland to serve four years in prison, showing that the authorities are unwilling to tolerate drug dealing and the devastating effects these substances have on Britain's communities. 16. Manuela Vitoria de Araujo Farias Indonesia has some of the world's strictest drug laws, which can land someone on death row even for a non-violent offense. So, it would be an understatement to say that it's a bad idea to try smuggling drugs into the country. A 19-year-old lingerie worker from Brazil named Manuela Vitoria de Araujo Farias is learning this lesson the hard way after authorities discovered three kilos of cocaine in her suitcase at Bali International Airport. Farias had just arrived in Indonesia when the drugs were found in January 2023. The cocaine had gone undetected throughout the two flights she took to reach the island. She was promptly arrested for trafficking, despite her claims that gang members somehow tricked her into smuggling the contraband. If convicted, Farias could face execution by firing squad. Her lawyer, Davi Lira da Silva, told the Bali Times that his client traveled to Bali because she wanted to pray in Buddhist temples for the healing of her gravely ill mother, who had recently suffered a stroke. Police in Santa Catarina, Brazil, have reportedly declined to comment on their investigation of the alleged gang members who gave Farias the drugs. The arrest came shortly after a 52-year-old Australian surfer named Jeffrey Walton managed to avoid the death penalty for smuggling drugs into Indonesia. In lieu of a traditional punishment, he spent eight months at a rehab facility, which isn't a bad deal compared to the alternative. Unlike Farias, he was caught with a personal supply of drugs, which was a factor in the court's willingness to be lenient. The outcome of the young woman's case, however, remains to be seen. 15. Abigail Finney After falling asleep in her boyfriend's dorm room at Purdue University one day in 2017, 20-year-old Abigail Finney awoke to what she thought was her partner trying to get frisky. 
She went along with it, only to realize afterward that she'd hooked up with her boyfriend's buddy. The room was dark, and Finney hadn't turned her head to look at him during the steamy session. She was understandably outraged and horrified after discovering that she'd just got it on with someone other than her boyfriend. The ordeal created some very confusing questions, including whether the act was consensual. Finney suddenly felt violated, so she and her boyfriend, Donald Grant Ward, went to the police. During questioning, Ward said that he truly believed Finney had mistakenly slept with his friend, thinking it was him. Assuming Ward's pal purposely deceived Finney, his actions were undoubtedly wrong from a moral standpoint. But the unusual scenario isn't considered a crime in most states, including Indiana, where the incident took place. Under the state's assault laws, the victim must be either compelled by force or unable to consent. Prosecutors nevertheless tried to argue the case in court, but a jury found Ward not guilty and he was acquitted of all the charges brought against him. The outcome came as a devastating blow to Finney, who said she struggled with anxiety and had to take time off from school while she dealt with the trauma of the ordeal. But until the state changes its definition of the crime that Ward was accused of, it's unlikely that cases like this will hold up in court. 14. Cynthia Hoffman Cynthia Hoffman thought Denali Bremer was her best friend, so she was happy to join when Bremer invited her to go hiking at Thunderbird Falls in Anchorage, Alaska one day in 2019. The young women were joined by a handful of other teens, including Bremer's friends, Caleb Leyland and Caden McIntosh. During the visit, the group lured Hoffman away from the main trail and into an isolated spot, where they bound and shot her before throwing her lifeless body into the nearby Eklutna River. Caden McIntosh pulled the trigger while Bremer snapped photos and captured footage of the horrific crime for an online friend who talked her into carrying out the murder. The elusive individual who she knew only as Tyler claimed to be extremely wealthy. He offered Bremer $9 million to kill someone and capture it on camera for him. Most people in their right minds would never do it, but Bremer immediately got to planning the murder. She also recruited Leyland, McIntosh, and two other friends to help her execute and discard her best friend like trash. After the murder, the culprits got rid of Hoffman's belongings in an attempt to destroy evidence. When the victim failed to return home and her family began to worry, the killers claimed that they dropped Hoffman off at a location of her choosing after spending time in the park. They said they hadn't heard from her since then and had no knowledge of her whereabouts. But they did a poor job of covering their tracks, and it was only a matter of days before they were in police custody on suspicion of murder. Authorities also identified Bremer's online friend Tyler as 21-year-old man from Indiana named Darren Shill Miller and charged him as well. Bremer pleaded guilty to first-degree murder in early 2023. She faces 30 to 99 years in prison and is scheduled to be sentenced in August. But the cases against McIntosh, Leyland, and Shill Miller are ongoing. 13. Deadly Prank Kills Dictator's Brother Kim Jong-nam was the eldest son of the late Korean dictator Kim Jong-il and the half-brother of the Hermit Kingdom's current leader, Kim Jong-un. For several years during the 1990s, he was considered next in line for the throne. But he was booted from the line of succession in 2001 after he was caught trying to enter Disneyland in Tokyo with a fake passport, which brought deep embarrassment to the regime. Kim Jong-nam was then exiled two years later and proceeded to live a mostly low-key existence, minus his occasional outspoken criticism against the Kim dynasty. The Kims don't exactly have a good track record for tolerating even the slightest criticism, but to have negative statements from one of their own family members circulating in the international press was like an extra kick to the gut. It's believed that Kim Jong-nam survived at least one assassination attempt in 2006 and that his paranoid half-brother orchestrated it in a bid to permanently silence him. Then, in February 2013, two women attacked Kim Jong-nam from behind with a deadly nerve agent called VX at the Kuala Lumpur International Airport in Malaysia. He was caught completely off guard, giving him no chance to avoid the poisoning. 
His condition almost immediately began to rapidly deteriorate, and Kim was unresponsive by the time he arrived in a nearby hospital. Unfortunately for the victim, efforts to save his life were unsuccessful. Authorities initially suspected that the women who ambushed Kim with the deadly toxin were knowingly working for North Korean agents, even though neither of them was from North Korea or had any traceable ties to the regime. Shortly after the poisoning, four North Korean suspects managed to slip out of the country without being interrogated, leaving Siti Aisha and Duan Ti Huang behind to take full blame for the incident. The women claimed that they had no idea they were going to end up killing someone and that it certainly wasn't their intention. They told police that they were offered paid gigs on a hidden camera show and thought they were carrying out a harmless prank. And while this may seem like a clever excuse, all signs pointed toward the women being truthful. In what appeared to be an elaborate ruse to fool the suspects into unknowingly assassinating Kim, the show's so-called producers had filmed Aisha and Huang performing multiple on-camera pranks in public places in the days leading up to the incident. It seemed to the women that they were filming a real TV show, and they had no reason to think that the people who hired them had sinister intentions. Aisha and Huang were initially charged with the murder, but the criminal charges against the pair were eventually dropped. 12. Nicholas Billingham when 42-year-old Nicholas Billingham stopped showing up for work in October 2021, his boss, who also happened to be his neighbor, went looking for him at the home he shared with his longtime girlfriend in Northamptonshire, England. Billingham's girlfriend, schoolteacher Fiona Beale, answered the door looking visibly upset by something. She didn't want to talk at first but later claimed that Billingham had cheated on her and moved in with another woman. Because the man had a history of being unfaithful, the neighbor took Beale's explanation at face value. And a few weeks later, Beale seemed to be back to her normal self and appeared to be moving on with her life. Around the same time, Billingham's relatives became concerned and reached out after not hearing from him for a while. They received text messages from his phone saying that he was laying low after his relationship with Beale fell apart. Wanting to respect his space, they left the situation alone. In early 2023, around five months after Billingham was last seen alive, police responded to a call at Beale's residence about a mentally unstable woman in distress. Responding officers came across Beale's diary, which appeared to contain a confession to murdering Billingham and burying him in her yard. According to the journal, Beale lured Billingham into their bathroom with the promise of a good time, then put a mask on him and stabbed him to death. She was apparently convinced that he'd cheated on her again, which explains the motive behind the crime. A search of the yard turned up Billingham's mummified remains. In court, Beale admitted to manslaughter but denied murdering her partner on the basis of her fragile mental state at the time. As of May 2023, her trial appears to be ongoing. 11. Migrants Dash Dreams During an interview with Coda Media in early 2023, 45-year-old Gurinder Dillon described how he migrated from Punjab, India to southern Italy's Lazio region in 2009 for work. An agent he met in his home village had promised a better life, including high enough pay to support his family back in India, a house, nice clothing, and other trappings of a middle-class European lifestyle. But as you've likely already guessed, Dillon bought a false dream. Using a $60,000 loan, he paid the agent to arrange his visa and travel, which realistically only cost around $2,000, amounting to an enormous profit for the recruiter. Dylan expected to work at a farm in an area called the Pontine Marshes picking fruit and vegetables, and while that part was true, the working and living conditions he was subjected to were much different than promised. For less than four euros per hour, he and others toiled away in the stifling heat as an overseer harshly barked orders at them to work faster and pick more produce. As the temperature crept into the triple digits on his first day of work, Dylan had to stop at least once to wring the sweat out of his drenched socks. He later told Coda journalist Isabel Cockerell that he quickly realized he'd been duped into signing up for a job that he said wasn't far removed from forced labor. When he asked an experienced co-worker if it would be like this forever, the colleague answered, yes. 
The tradition of recruiting workers to the Pontine marshes from other countries dates back to the Mussolini era. Under the dictator's leadership, laborers transformed the once swampy marshland into a vast tract of farmable soil. But the working conditions there remain brutal and archaic, and amount of forced labor under the United Nations standards due to the low wages, long working hours, and controlling bosses. Some are paid almost no money, with at least one person being told that three months worth of his wages were put toward taxes. When he looked further into the matter, he discovered it was a lie. His taxes hadn't been paid and had unknowingly worked for free. Another worker told Cockerell that he was paid just $250 after being promised around $1,300 for a monthly check, which included working 12 to 14 hour shifts six days a week. Sadly, these laborers are at the mercy of their supervisors, who have the power to interfere with their immigration status. And as Italy experiences a suspended revival of elements of its fascist past with the rise of pro-Mussolini Prime Minister Giorgia Maloney, hope for better conditions and basic rights at these farms has sadly hit a new low. 10. Problems in Paradise From 1959 to 1984, North Korea encouraged ethnic Koreans to move there from South Korea and Japan as part of a repatriation program that essentially promised a paradise on Earth. Designed to help compensate for the number of workers lost in the Korean War, it was carried out with the support of the Japanese government, which allowed the deceptive campaign to be promoted within the country and helped arrange transportation to North Korea. The program mainly targeted Koreans who were living in Japan many of whom were forcibly relocated there and subjected to brutal working conditions. Lured by the prospect of jobs, education, free healthcare, and other benefits, around 93,000 people took advantage of the opportunity, only to discover that life in North Korea was nothing like it was cranked up to be. In addition to being assigned low-paying manual labor jobs, enduring egregious human rights violations, and being afforded little freedom, they unfortunately learned that leaving the country wasn't as easy as entering, and that the only way to do it was to escape the oppressive regime. People who were caught trying to escape North Korea are typically shot on sight, executed at a later date, or imprisoned at one of the regime's brutal labor camps, where they're essentially worked and starved to the brink of death. To deter citizens from trying to flee, North Korea authorities similarly punished the extended relatives and multiple generations of a family, even if they had nothing to do with a person's escape or attempted escape. In 2018, five of the estimated 150 people who managed to leave North Korea after entering the repatriation program filed a lawsuit in a Japanese court, accusing Pyongyang of illegal solicitation and detainment. They requested several hundred thousand dollars each in compensation, but their hopes were dashed in early 2023 when the court shot down the claims. Because the litigants entered the program between 1960 and 1972, their complaints had surpassed the 20-year statute of limitations. Moreover, the judge overseeing the case ruled that the Japanese court has no jurisdiction over the escapees' detainment in North Korea. The lawyer representing the plaintiffs, Genji Fukuda, said that his clients planned to appeal their cases. He also accused the judge of failing to address the matter head-on and stressed the importance of supporting the victims and holding Pyongyang accountable. The plaintiffs, who said that many of the people who took part in the program have died, continue to hold out hope not only that their lawsuit will prevail, but that their relatives who haven't escaped will be rescued from North Korea. And while they know that Kim Jong-un most likely won't pay them anything, even if he's ordered to do so, a favorable verdict would set a precedent for future cases. 9. Rosana Delgado In April 2021, 37-year-old mother of two and rideshare driver Rosana Delgado never came home after telling her husband, Yoni Castro, that she was about to pick up her last customer of the day. Castro attempted to find his wife by tracing her last known movements through her cell phone data, and when he discovered a bloody mask at one of the locations she'd been to earlier that day, he called the police. 
A week later, Rosanna's charred remains were found at a remote cabin 120 miles from the Atlanta area shopping mall that she was last seen alive at. It was her last stop after enduring days of brutal torture at the hands of an international drug gang. According to prosecutors, Rosanna was lured to the mall under the guise of a shopping trip. The captors then moved her to various locations over the next week before taking her to the cabin and murdering her. Authorities believe the gang members planned the abduction ahead of time. It's unclear whether Rosanna knew any of the suspects or if she knew the suspects' motives for kidnapping her. By the time any of the guilty party were identified, most of them had fled the area and some had even left the country. While three still remain at large, federal agents managed to track down and arrest most of the co-conspirators. In early 2022, a grand jury indicted 14 defendants on a laundry list of federal charges, including murder, kidnapping, concealing a death, aggravated battery, RICO violations, and more. Oscar Manuel Garcia, who faced the most serious charges, pleaded guilty to a slew of counts, with one charge being malice murder. As a result, he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Defendant Juan Ayala Rodriguez managed to avoid a murder conviction, but nevertheless received a life sentence due to the severity of his crimes. Three other defendants received varying prison terms, ranging from 13 to 30 years, while a handful of other suspects received unspecified sentences. 8. Alex Hamzi and Dustin Del Monte Members of law enforcement risk their lives daily to protect society, and sometimes they're targeted specifically for being cops. Such was the case for Connecticut State Police Sergeant Alex Hamsey and Lieutenant Dustin DeMonte, who responded to a home in Bristol late one evening in October 2022 after receiving a call about an alleged domestic incident between siblings. It sounded pretty routine, but after arriving on the scene, they were met with a deadly barrage of gunfire that claimed both their lives. A third responding officer, Alec Lorato, was injured but survived. Officer Lorato returned fire and killed the suspected shooter, 35-year-old Nicholas Brutcher, at the scene. His brother, 32-year-old Nathan Brutcher, survived with injuries and was released from the hospital a few days later. The Brutcher's neighbor, Danny Rodriguez, told CBS News that he heard dozens of gunshots at the home across the street, followed by a distraught female voice yelling, You killed them! Shortly after the incident, authorities revealed that they believe Nicholas Brutcher placed a fake 911 call to lure the officers to the residence. Five months later, in early 2023, questions still surrounded the senseless ambush. According to records obtained by local station WFSB, Brutcher lied in wait for the police to arrive, hiding behind some bushes in camouflage with an AR-15 in his hands, ready to fire at any moment. He reportedly shot more than 80 rounds at the officers, attacking them from behind when they were almost completely defenseless against the onslaught of bullets. Body cam footage showed that the police were ordering the brother, Nathan Bruncher, to exit the home with his hands up when the shooting began. Records haven't revealed who shot Nathan or if he was suspected of committing any crimes. But according to witnesses, the brothers were involved in a disturbance at a local bar earlier that night. The details of that incident, however, haven't been released to the public. The disturbing tragedy remains under investigation by the state police and the officer of the inspector general. 7. Fake Volunteer Victimizes Elderly Florida Woman A 91-year-old woman was watering her plants outside her home near Winter Park, Florida one evening in early 2023 when a white sedan pulled up. The senior citizen was approached by a woman claiming to be a YMCA volunteer who said she was there because the homeowner's backyard shared a property line with an abandoned YMCA facility. She said she needed access to the elderly woman's backyard so she could conduct a property assessment. The homeowner let the supposed volunteer into her yard and kept an eye on her for the next 20 to 30 minutes while she stood near the property line and took several phone calls. During the conversations, the woman could be heard discussing plans for the construction of a parking lot and to cut down a tree that was damaging the senior citizen's fence. 
it all sounded legit, according to the homeowner's daughter, Teresa Hood, who later told Click Orlando that the family had contacted the YMCA repeatedly in the past over code violations. After the representative left, the elderly woman realized that numerous valuables were missing from inside her home. Other valuable items were left untouched, causing Seminole County deputies to initially wonder if she had simply misplaced the things that were missing. But a thorough search of the home turned up no sign of the belongings, and they ultimately concluded that the volunteer was a fake who lured the victim into her backyard so someone else could carry out the robbery unnoticed. A YMCA spokesperson told law enforcement that they hadn't sent a representative to the woman's home and that they planned to sell and demolish the property. Authorities said they were investigating the crime in hopes of identifying and arresting the suspects on burglary and grand theft charges. But at the moment, it's unclear whether the thieves are still at large. 6. Pensioner Kidnapped in Perth In early 2023, a 68-year-old retiree from China traveled to Australia to discuss a potential business opportunity with a 29-year-old man. He flew into Melbourne, where he met with his prospective partner, and the pair proceeded to fly to Western Australia together. From there, they drove to a house in Perth. But instead of entering a business agreement like the man from China expected, he was held captive and tortured by the younger man and two accomplices who were waiting at the home when they arrived. The kidnappers called the victim's relatives and demanded ransom payments in exchange for his release. But instead, the man's family contacted law enforcement. Police tracked the man's location to a short-term rental unit and bashed the door in. And after two days of enduring horrifying treatment, he was finally safe. Afterward, the victim was taken to the hospital with multiple injuries. In addition to the 29-year-old suspect, two men aged 31 and 37 were arrested in connection with the alleged extortion plan. They remain in custody amid their ongoing cases, and their identities remain concealed for the time being in accordance with Australian law. 5. Alexander Litvinenko While working for Russia's Federal Security Service in the late 1990s, Alexander Litvinenko spoke out against acts of corruption that he claimed to have witnessed firsthand. He publicly accused high-ranking law enforcement officials of having ties to organized crime groups, plotting the assassination of a wealthy oligarch and ordering him to kill government spies. After realizing there was no way to escape the crookedness of the Russian state as long as he remained in the country, especially as a government employee, Litvinenko packed up his family in 2000 and fled to London, where they were granted asylum. Over the next handful of years, he became even more outspoken against corruption, writing two books filled with scathing allegations against Moscow. In October 2006, Litvinenko accused Vladimir Putin of ordering the assassination of journalist Anna Politkovskaya, who was murdered at her apartment building after she refused orders to stop reporting on topics that the Russian government disapproved of. Of course, the country's officials denied any involvement in the crime, which remains unsolved to this day. But many people believe that state officials had something to do with it, since they had reasons for wanting to permanently silence Politkovskaya. Litvinenko could have taken the murder as a sign to perhaps tone down his own activism for a while, but he remained as vocal as ever. Less than a month after Politkovskaya's death and roughly a week before he was slated to testify about clandestine Russian activities in front of a Spanish court, he met with former KGB agents Andrei Lugovoy and Dmitry Kovta at a hotel in London for tea. He suddenly fell seriously ill shortly afterward, and his condition deteriorated rapidly. Two days later, Litvinenko was checked into intensive care. Doctors were powerless to help him as they struggled to figure out what was even wrong with him. All his hair started to fall out. He was vomiting violently and suffering from explosive diarrhea, and his mouth became filled with blisters. Soon enough, his organs began to shut down. With Litvinenko's help, doctors eventually discovered that he was completely riddled with an extremely toxic and highly radioactive chemical called polonium. During the meeting with the KGB agents, he unknowingly drank poison tea at the urging of his hosts. 
It was cold, so Limonenko only took a few sips out of politeness, but that was all it took to fatally poison him. Law enforcement then discovered terrifyingly high amounts of polonium in the sink drain of Lugovoy and Kovtun's hotel room. Litvinenko accused Vladimir Putin of directly ordering the hit, while his wife similarly suggested that Moscow orchestrated the assassination. British authorities seemed to agree, with one Scotland Yard official saying that the only credible explanation for the poisoning is that Russian officials were involved in one way or another. After languishing in agony for 22 days, Litvinenko passed away, and he was buried in a lead coffin to prevent radiation from leaking out of it. 4. Grinder Robberies There have been multiple headlining cases in recent years involving violent attacks and robberies on victims who were targeted through dating apps. One of the latest arrests came in April 2023 when 22-year-old Ja Auntie Pleasant was booked into custody in San Antonio, Texas on two separate murder charges. According to court documents, Pleasant connected with both of his victims on the Grinder dating app, where he went by the alias Derek. The first deadly encounter occurred after he invited a 54-year-old man to his apartment for a late-night rendezvous. Pleasant allegedly approached the victim while he sat in his SUV and fatally shot him from the passenger side. Witnesses reported seeing the suspect grab a duffel bag from inside the vehicle before fleeing the scene. The very next day, police were called to the apartment of a 21-year-old man, where a concerned friend had come by to check on him after being unable to reach him on the phone. While looking in through the window, the friend saw him lying motionless and unresponsive. Emergency responders entered the home and found the young man dead with a gunshot wound to the back of his head. In addition to finding messages between Pleasant and both victims, investigators discovered matching shell casings of both murder scenes. The suspect was also connected to the crimes through fingerprints. Thankfully, police tracked him down and took him into custody before he could harm or kill anyone else. He remains behind bars on two murder charges. 3. International Hostage Trap Tempted by the prospect of a job opportunity, a 19-year-old man from Alamo, Texas entered Mexico on foot in June of 2021 in hopes of making some money. A man he presumably didn't know very well, later identified as 26-year-old Sixto Gonzalez Jr., had offered him the job and promised to pick him up once he crossed the border. But instead of taking him to a work site, the stranger drove the teen to a house in the city of Reynosa, where he and several co-conspirators held the young man hostage. Gonzalez and his accomplices contacted the victim's family, demanding a $5,000 ransom and a gun in exchange for his safe return. When the family couldn't afford the ransom and failed to pay it, the gang sent them a dreadful video of the victim being beaten so hard with a wooden board that it broke. Two days into the ordeal, law enforcement managed to locate the house and carried out a search. Beneath a blanket, they found the victim covered in bruises and bound with zip ties. Police also captured Gonzalez, and in a satisfying turn of events, he was taken into custody while the hostage got his freedom back. Gonzalez reportedly confessed to the abduction during questioning. He spent the next two years in federal custody while he faced charges in connection with the incident and he might as well get comfortable because he likely won't be seeing freedom again for at least a handful of years. In 2023, Gonzalez pleaded guilty to hostage taking. The charge carries a sentence of up to life in prison and a fine of up to $250,000. The defendant is scheduled to be sentenced in August of 2023. 2. Deathbed Confession Leads to Missing Florida Man in May of 2014, a Florida businessman with a checkered past named Donald Schoff vanished seemingly into thin air. His brother-in-law, James Stote, told Schoff's mother and his wife, as well as Schoff's sister, that he'd fled the country on his boat with a large amount of cash. Stote claimed that Schoff was living in Colombia under an alias, and his wife Dara and mother-in-law initially believed it, given Schoff's shady history. Every once in a while, Stowe told the family that he'd run into Schoff during one of his quick and highly secretive stops back in the United States. 
About a year later, Dara discovered that her husband had taken over her brother's identity and was allegedly siphoning his bank accounts. As it turned out, Schoff had been working to keep his life on the straight and narrow. His business was apparently doing well and he'd built up a considerable amount of assets as a real estate investor. Suspicious that Stoke was lying about Schoff being alive and well, Dara filed for divorce and went to the FBI. But the fate of her missing brother remained a mystery for years until 2021, when Stoke's former roommate Siegfried Maha fell gravely ill. In a shocking deathbed confession that nobody saw coming, Maha called a former cop he was acquainted with and revealed that Schoff had been murdered around the time he disappeared in 2014. He went on to accuse another one of Schoff's sisters, 64-year-old Darlene Ann Schoff Brock, of shooting her brother in the back of the head. Maha drew a map directing authorities to Schoff's remains, which were buried on one of his own properties in Danya Beach. While awaiting DNA test results to confirm the identity of the body, investigators questioned Darlene, who stunk to the claim that her brother had left the country years earlier. But she quickly lawyered up and stopped cooperating. Law enforcement also spoke with Stoat, who reportedly gave detectives a first-hand account of what happened on the night of the murder. His version of events corroborated with the details of his former roommate's deathbed confession, and the DNA findings confirmed that the remains belonged to Schoff. In the end, Darling was charged with first-degree murder. According to records, she's being held at the Broward County Jail on $250,000 bail while her case works its way through the court system. Stote, on the other hand, hasn't been charged in connection with the case, despite his alleged involvement. 1. Swindled by Psychics An Australian woman named Poonam paid $30 for a psychic reading at a shop in Sydney, which marked her first step toward financial ruin. By the time she shared her experience with the TV program A Current Affair in 2022, Poonam had blown more than $21,000 on the services of a clairvoyant, who always managed to keep her on the hook and continuously opening up her checkbook. Poonam told the show that she went to get her initial reading for fun. She never expected to become a seemingly bottomless pit of cash to her spiritual guide. But her fortune teller convinced her that she was surrounded by bad spirits, and that the only way to get rid of them was to invest in one round after the next of intensive prayers and rituals. A woman named Sam Jana, who visited the same psychic, claimed that she was told her family would die unless she paid to be cleansed of the demons surrounding her. Much like how Poonam got sucked in, the countless rituals never seemed to do the job. There was always some stubborn, lingering presence of evil, which of course would require yet another payment to make it go away. Unfortunately, Sam Jana didn't fully realize that she was being financially siphoned for no good reason until after all her money was depleted. And before she knew it, she had lost her entire life savings. From the outside looking in, it may seem like only a highly gullible person could fall for such an obvious scam. In fact, some people even have a hard time feeling bad for victims of these types of scams. But it happens often, and to perfectly intelligent people, with many victims losing tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars. In fact, no human is immune to being manipulated, and crooked psychics are the absolute masters at it. They know how to target people's insecurities and to attract business from customers who are going through difficult times by selling their misguided hope. In recent years, the number of Australians being swindled by greedy fortune tellers has reportedly skyrocketed, causing deepening concerns among the country's scam watchdog groups as customers desperate for guidance and answers are bled completely dry. Between 2015 and 2018, the number of psychic scams increased by an estimated 300%, and civilians were siphoned to the tune of millions. It's likely safe to assume that the losses were bigger than the data shows, since not all scams get reported. With most of the world seeming to agree that times are bad right now, the problem only seems to be getting worse, and it's not only happening in Australia. Many modern-day spiritual scams are being carried out entirely on social media, where fraudsters have access to an unlimited pool of potential victims right from the comfort of their home.
Thank you for watching. If you had to choose, would you feel more sympathetic towards someone who was injured after jumping off a cruise ship or someone who was attacked by a wild animal while trying to take a selfie with it? Let us know in the comments below and be sure to subscribe.